Starting with the question, Allah says, we have created you. So why do you not believe? We have created you. So why do you not believe? Now, if you take a look at Islamic monotheism, you would come to realize that Allah's test for us is that we worship him alone. And the most important word is alone. Singularly, one, it is known as Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what Islam is based upon, which means it is wrong for us to worship anyone or anything besides he who made us. So when you want to render an act of worship, two things need to happen. One is you need to render it solely for whoever made you, whoever created you. That's what or that's who you are rendering the act of worship for. And that is Allah, meaning the worshipped one. He is the one I worship. So whenever I say Allah is the greatest, what I'm saying is he who made me is the greatest. He who is in control of every aspect of my existence is the greatest. He whom I'm going to return to when I die is the greatest. That is called worshipping one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it doesn't mean there are many Allahs. It's just one Allah, but we say worshipping He alone. Now, if you take a look at the term La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, there was a time when people translated it into the English language saying, there is no God but Allah. I'm sure you've heard that. There is no God but Allah. And Muhammad, may peace be upon him, is his messenger. If you take a look at the translation, it's not accurate. The reason is, one might argue there are many gods. How can you say there is no God? There is no God but Allah. Someone might say, well, the Hindus have gods, the others have gods, people have gods. Even some of the Muslims worship deities besides Allah out of ignorance or, uh, you know, making big mistakes, whatever. Similarly, you have Christians who worship the cross. Some of them worship Jesus, who happens to be a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though very noble, very lo lofty and so on. So uh, people worship sticks and stones and animals and graves, and they call them gods. They say the God, they, the sun is the God of this and the moon is the God of that. And they have the God of whatever else they have God. So if you say there is no God, it's a statement that one might argue is wrong. There are so many gods. So what is the proper translation? La ma'buda bihaqqin. That word bihaqqin is of essence. There is no God worthy of worship besides Allah. You saw the difference? One says there is no God but Allah. Someone can say, well, there are so many gods besides Allah. But the point is, we don't worship any one of them besides Allah because none of them are worthy of worship besides Allah. So now the statement becomes correct. There is no God worthy of worship besides Allah. You see where we get that from? It's the translation. This is why we say in Arabic, it's clear. When you say la ilaha, it means there is no God worthy of worship. Besides Allah, illa Allah, besides Allah. So we need to say it in the English language. In the Arabic, if we were to interpret it or say it in the long form, it would be la ma'abuda bihaqqin illa Allah. There is no one worthy of worship besides Allah. Uh, so this is something very interesting. Allah says, Nahnu We made you. How can you worship everything besides us? We made you. You don't take a risk. You should not be taking a risk. You should say, Oh, you who made me, you are the greatest. Oh, you who made me, I put my head on the ground for you. Oh, you who made me, you are the one. That's it. So this is why Allah says, Nahnu falawla tusaddiqun. We have created you. So why do you not believe? Have you seen that which you emit? Now Allah is drawing our attention to how insignificant man is and how he started off being just a droplet of semen. So Allah says, have you seen what you emit? This is addressing the men folk and addressing human beings at large to say at the point where you were just a droplet of semen. Allah says, do you see what you emit? Is it you who created it or we the creator? Who created it? Don't come and tell us, oh, this is nature and it just happened coincidentally. We were apes before swinging from tree to tree and so on. No, no, we were not apes. 
Maybe those who said it might have been apes, not us. So this is what it is. So one might say, well, what is the difference now? In Islam, we believe that human beings, and not just Islam, Judaism, Christianity, share the belief that we were created from Adam. And Allah created the form of a human being, much bigger, much taller than us. And he said, be, and it was. He was created, Adam, may peace be upon him. So now there are discoveries of uh, you know, fossils and so many other things, little old skeletons that are carbon dated to uh, millions of years and they say that man was just like apes. So what does Islam say about that? Because they bring you the whole skeleton and they show you, listen, here's the evidence. Where, how can you say that it's wrong? We are showing it to you in front of your nose. So we have a simple answer. That was a different species. That wasn't man. Those were real gorillas and apes and whatever else you want. So today, if someone shows me a fossil of a monkey, it doesn't make him a human being. You go and see, look, go to the zoo, the one we have nearby here. The chimpanzee there looks quite close to human beings. So if they found a fossil of a chimpanzee that existed some years back, some centuries ago or millions of years ago, it doesn't make it uh, evolution of man. The chimpanzee still exists and if they've become extinct there are so many species that have become extinct so it doesn't make it man there is no evidence to prove that it wasn't we were not created from adam so therefore we won't accept it so it's a simple answer to say you're talking of a different species now my mothers and sisters when you talk of evolution what is the meaning of evolution when people say theory of evolution does islam accept it some people say yes and some people say no the answer is it depends what you're talking about. If you are talking of the one part of the theory that states that uh, we were from apes, then we reject it totally. But if you are speaking of another part of the theory that states that man adapts to his environment, then yes, Allah says that man does adapt to his environment. So you have people who are dark skinned in certain areas, people who are light skinned, people who are hairy, people who lack that hair and so on. Uh, people have adapted to different conditions of weather and different conditions of their surroundings. Yes, we definitely do believe that. That is a portion of what they call the theory of evolution. It doesn't mean we accept the entire theory. I hope you follow what I'm saying. So when people say, speak of this theory, we say, look, whatever Allah has spoken about, if it happens to fall within some of what these people have called a theory, we will accept it because Allah has said it. And as for the part that says that we're from animals and apes and we were not actually human before, and you know, uh, for that we will disagree and we will say, no way, we believe in revelation. And like I said, it's not just the Muslims, it's the Jews and the Christians and even uh, people of a few other uh, religious beliefs who will confirm that we were created from a single man, therefore, thereafter a female and thereafter we spread onto the earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That's, that droplet of semen, did you create it or did we create it? We have decreed death among you and we are not to be outdone. Wow, look at the power of Allah. Allah says, we have decreed death. From the time you were in your mother's womb, we decreed when you were going to be born, when you were going to die. Which means you are here for a purpose. Do not fool yourself. My mothers and sisters, never fool yourself. Don't fool yourself that I'm here to enjoy, to have, to this, to that. Enjoyment is a gift of Allah that you get a little bit of, yes. But Allah says, we will also let you taste sadness to show you who is the greatest. We will also let you go through days when you do not get what you want to show you who is the controller of everything you have. We will also let you go through days when your health will be failing to show you who is the controller of health. We will also, go th we will also let you go through something known as death to show you that this world was not everything. It is definitely just a passing phase, a stage, a testing ground, and you will cross beyond. So Allah says, the fact that Allah created or decreed death already should prove to you that you are here on earth for a short purpose, or should I say for a short time and a specific purpose. Subhanallah. It's amazing. And this is why we believe that when a person dies, they, they will go down into their graves. That grave is actually a garden from the gardens of paradise or a pit from the pits of hell. It's up to you. To decide which way you would like to go and you work towards it you have to work towards it because 
if you do not work towards what you would like to achieve, then how do you expect Allah to give it to you? Don't just say, Allah's already predestined where I'm going to go, so let me sit back and relax. Because then the foolishness of sitting back and relaxing would have contributed towards ending where you ended. Allah's already written whether you're going to pass your A-levels or not, so let me just sit at home. Well, Allah would have written that you were going to be so stupid to sit at home, not even enroll at a school or college, and not even write the exam, and you expected the certificate to actually uh, be sent by a fairy. Fairies, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Well, you'll get a job also from the same fairy, and you'll get also a lot of gold and silver from the same fairy that you can use. And you can spend on people who believe in those fairies. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we have decreed death among you and we are not to be outdone. نَحْنُ قَدَّرْنَا بَيْنَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَسْبُوقِينَ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are not to be outdone in, in that we will change your likeness and produce you in that form which you do not know. Now this is something interesting because an alternative meaning has also been given. I'm reading the footnote here. It says, in that we will replace the likes of you with others on earth and create you in the hereafter in that which you do not know. So Allah is telling us, we have decreed death upon you and when you die, we replace you with someone else. Your great, great grandchildren, you may never see them. They will take your place. The house you are living in now, if it was built in 1948, like a lot of the houses in this area, perhaps a little bit earlier. 1948, the houses in Belvedere. 1945 and so on. You don't know who lived there. What happened? Allah took them away. Today you are staying there. You don't even know what happened. Many of us don't even know if gruesome murder took place where we are. And then we're getting all these nightmares and we don't know why. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. And you don't know. You don't know what's going on. But Allah says, look, it's simple. The fact that you don't know who was in this house 20 years back already shows that this life is very temporary. Very temporary. I remember recently I stumbled across photographs of the house I live in many, many years back and it looked like such a different place. Nobody would believe it's the same place that you're living in now because you make these little changes that you don't realize have facelifted the place or changed it completely. Subhanallah. That's a sign to prove to you that you know what, you're going to go, people after you are going to change things. Everything's going to change. And there will be different people. So that's one of the translations is, we will replace you with others who are different. And another translation is that you will be resurrected in a different body altogether. In a way that you right now do not know. You just have to believe. And we've spoken about this last week as well, where we made mention of the fact that you resurrected in a different body. So Allah says, we will not be outdone. We are not to be outdone in that we will change your likeness and produce you in a form that you do not know. So I've told you there are two translations to that. And you have already known the first creation, Allah says. So will you not remember? You've already known the first creation. First creation referring to who you are right now and those who were before you. You already know, you know quite a bit, subhanallah. You take a look at uh, your grandfather, your great grandfather, the earliest of your forefathers whom you had met. Think about them. You know them, don't you? You met them. Where did they go? What happened to them? Or when they speak to you about their folks and their parents who are your relatives, Allah says, this, all this is worth thinking about because it should bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, will you not remember? And the reason why Allah says, will you not remember is there comes a time when you cannot remember. You don't know. You won't remember anything. And then Allah says, أَفَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا تَحْرُثُونَ You want another sign of the greatness of Allah. Well, have you not seen the seed which you sow? 
You know, here in Zimbabwe, the land is so, mashallah, fertile that if you were to throw seeds, even by mistake, it would grow. Whether they're apples or bananas or whatever you, you, you know, you've thrown lemon trees and so on, it happens. So Allah says, have you not seen the seed which you sow? Who made it? Who created this master plan that you sow a seed and the whole tree will grow? And when the fruit from that tree grows, the inside that fruit or somewhere along that plantation will be seeds that will result in the continuation of the same plantation and the uh, producing of the same fruit or vegetable, whatever produce is there, continuously. Just through the seed. And this is why there are people now who want to remove the seeds. One of the dangers of it is they begin to control the food in the world. They, there's no seed. You open a watermelon, take a look at how many seeds there are. And we say, ooh, this one has no seeds. It's so sweet. It's lovely. Well, there's a problem there because how are you going to plant? You're not going to get more. You're going to be dependent on someone who took those seeds away. So don't get too excited. We have seedless oranges. Wow, lovely. You know, the bite bridge oranges, sweet, sweet as ever, seedless. Someone's controlling somewhere. Enjoy the seeds. If I were you, crush them, bite them, eat them, swallow them. They, a little bit of roughage will do you good, inshallah. When I was a kid, I remember we used to swallow these, these watermelon seeds. And uh, we were told that, you know, you better watch your ears because greenery will start growing from there. Little stem will shoot out of your ears. And as we grew older, a few hairs perhaps popped out of our ears. May Allah forgive us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us His gift. He says, Have you not seen the seeds which you, you sow? Is it you who makes it grow or are we the grower? Allahu Akbar. Allah is telling you, pause, oh man, sit for a while, think the greatness of Allah. Who causes the seed to grow? Is it you or is it us? This is why they say reading the surah uh, regularly would uh, improve your sustenance. And the reason is not that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from poverty in a way that you wish, but in a way that He wishes. Look, Allah's created things. Nobody here can tell us in Zimbabwe that we've run out of vegetation. If you were utilizing the land, the little piece of land that you have uh, to plant. It's, we're not in a desert. We're in the most fertile land. Some of the land here is perhaps, you know, level one in terms of fertility on earth. Africa is known for that gift. So nobody can say I'm a poor person. But you say I'm reading Surah Waqa'ah every day and I still can't pay my debts. Well, there's a problem. Perhaps you did something wrong. Perhaps the, the equation is not complete. So on its own, it's not going to be able to assist or help just like that in a way that you wish. But Allah shows you different things. You have food provided for. You have shelter provided for. You have drink provided for. You have so many other things. But you will need to make an effort over and above just reading. Verses of the Quran. You can't just say, I need to pass my exam, so I need to read the surah of the Quran, for example. And you just read the surah, no studying, no swatting, and you go back there. For all I care, when they ask you about photosynthesis, you can't just give them a verse of the Quran and tell them, I was reading this last night. You need to answer the question. You need to have learned, you need to have studied, swatted. So the same applies here. You read it, Allah is talking about you, how you were born. Allah is talking about the plantation. Well, read it with the meaning. And this is why my mothers and sisters, I always say, a lot of the times we lose the plot because we haven't even known the meaning of these verses. And why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept virtue in certain verses? And it's amazing that if we were just to ponder over the verses, we would be receiving and achieving a lot of goodness. Take a look at Surah Alam Nashrah. They call it Surah Al-Sharh. And Surah Al-Duha, Wal-Duha Wal-Layli Ida Sajah. These two surahs, we know them off by heart since we were kids. We've learned them, we've memorized them. Do you know how powerful they are? Wal-Duha Wal-Layli Ida Sajah. The word, Ma Wadda'aka Rabbuka Wa Ma Qala, on its own, would actually cool you down, calm you, and really make you a person whose stress and depression and tension is all gone, if you understood it and believed in it. 
Allah is telling you, Allah did not forsake you. He did not leave you. He's not angry with you. Things didn't happen your way. It doesn't mean Allah's upset with you. Subhanallah. The same applies to Surah Al-Sharh, where Allah speaks about, Indeed, with hardship, there will always be ease. Don't think you're not going to get hardship, because you won't know what ease is unless you have tasted hardship. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us read the meanings of the Quran, the verses, and then you'll understand. So Allah is saying, look at the seed here, the seed that you sow. Now imagine if someone says, well, I didn't sow any seed. I'm just waiting for the produce to be given from you, O oh Allah. You are the sustainer and you've written how much I'm going to get. Ten tomatoes I expect by tomorrow morning, seven o'clock. Are you mad? If you wanted ten tomatoes, you should have planted the seeds. And trust me, in a few days time, you'll already see the shoots here in this country. Like I said, thank Allah for it. There are others who can plant whatever they want. It just doesn't grow because of the type of soil they have. But no, we're okay. My grass must look nice. My lawn, you know, we got the greenest of lawns, you know, subhanallah. And then we complain, there's no vegetable. We'll start eating grass. Allahu Akbar. It's beautiful, isn't it? Reminds me of this uh, Eid al-Adha, mashallah, people who have these sheep and so on, you know, beautiful little sheep in their homes and, and uh, they, they, they eat the, the lawn and, the, and people get upset. Well, that's the food of the sheep. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Really, we have been blessed. My mothers and sisters, if you have traveled throughout the world or even a few countries or if you've heard, we are blessed in a million and one ways. Alhamdulillah, thank Allah. No electricity, no water, huge potholes on the streets. We are still perhaps some of the most blessed people on earth. Trust me, the peace, the contentment you have, the fact that you're, you know, you can sow seeds and they can grow, you can have food and vegetation and so on. Subhanallah, wallahi, we, to say someone has died of hunger is actually an insult, an insult in, in a nation like this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and ease and make us be thankful. It's only through gratitude to Allah that you achieve more. Yes, your days will be difficult. Not all the days are going to be easy. You're going to have difficult days. But that does not mean that you are not living a luxurious life compared to, the, to others on the globe. I know of people living in first world countries. They don't enjoy their lives as much as we do. My mothers and sisters, subhanAllah. I know of people who are living in first world countries who are totally depressed and suicidal just because they have made a few errors and mistakes when it comes to taking loans from banks and they're paying back 20 times more than what they ever paid in the first place or received in the first place in order to make a payment for their furniture or what have you. With us, solve the problem. Put the mattress on the floor and as we say, hit the sack. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. And you sleep, beautiful sleep, air condition. You don't really need a fan or an air condition here as in, in terms of desperation. It's not that hot, that cold. No, the daytime temperature in this country will not go below approximately 15. And the, it will not go above approximately 35, approximately. You might have a little bit here and there. You look at that mean and that average, you can compete with the global weather. You're one of the best on earth, subhanAllah. Still, we have fans and heaters and air conditioning units. And nowadays, we cannot survive without it. Why? Room temperature is 23. My room is 26. Those three degrees, I can't sleep. That's our children. You noticed? May Allah forgive us, really. So we become depressed because of three degrees. That's it. And others are living 45 degrees and they're still saying, Oh, it's cool today, man. Yesterday was 50. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. My mothers and sisters, I'm just mentioning this to draw your attention to the fact that we have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, If we willed, we could make it dry. And you would remain in wonder. You see these seeds, Allah says, is it you who made it grow or are we the grower? If we wanted, we could make it dry debris. And you would remain in wonder saying, indeed, we are now in debt. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could cause that and he has and he does sometimes in order to wake people up to the reality that he is the greatest and to the reality that life is a test. Not every day will be the same. Today you made a huge profit in business. You might have to close down your store in a few years time because it's no longer what people want to buy. So Allah says, and have you seen the water that you drink? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah. Have you seen the water that you drink? Have you thought of it? Clear cut water, clear, beautiful, extremely tasty. In this part of the world, sweet water, mashallah, sweet. If we had to bottle the water that we got in our own yards, the boreholes that we have, trust me, we would be multi-millionaires. The globe would wish for this water. Mashallah. Amazing. People complain this the, the water that you, you get from the tap, you know, you can no longer drink it and so on. Trust me, there are people who get brown water. It looks like tea coming from the tap. Tea, automatic. Mashallah. You just need to connect a little heater on the other side and you get pure tea. We have a gift of Allah. We drink proper pure water. Alhamdulillah. Those who have boreholes, you know, this masjid, mashallah, it has water that is some of the best water that I've tasted in, in my life, I think. Subhanallah. And the whole world is allowed to come and collect water from here. They've kept it an open door policy. Subhanallah. You find Muslims and non-Muslims coming and filling their drums. Why? It's a gift of Allah. Subhanallah. So many gallons per hour. Mashallah. You have pure water, complete, absolutely amazing quenching water and Allah says have you ever thought of it that's what Allah is saying have you ever thought of it the water that you drink have you ever thought of it this is now connected to protection from poverty it's actually sustenance it's speaking about sustenance Allah sustained you through providing water for you through letting the seeds grow for you so you've got to make an effort you've got to either drill the borehole or you've got to do something you know the well needs to be sunk or you have to sow the seeds in order for them to to grow as in plantation you cannot just expect it to happen but Allah is saying it's there have you thought of it is it you who brought this water down from the clouds or did we bring it down? Ask yourself, who brought it down? Who gave you the water? Is it you or is it Allah who put it there for you? If we willed, we could have made it bitter. If we willed, we could have made this water bitter. You would not be able to drink it. So why are you not grateful? Allahu Akbar. May Allah make us from among those who are grateful. Look at the question Allah is asking. Allah says, whenever you drink water, whenever you drink any liquid, tell yourself, if Allah wanted, this could have been so bitter that I would not be able to drink it. So let me just be thankful to Allah. What did I say at the beginning? Sweet water. You know the lime scale in water, when it goes beyond a certain point, it's dangerous for your health. But up to a certain point, it actually makes your water sweeter. Did you ever know that? Subhanallah. Are you grateful? That's the question Allah is asking. Verse number 70. Then Allah says, And have you seen the fire that you ignite? You light a fire. Is it you who produced its tree? Or are we the producer? And tree here refers, refers to everything. The fossils and so on. Even the oil that you get from underneath the ground. From beneath you the fossil or whatever, how, however it has come about. Allah says, who provided that? Have you ever thought of it? The fire that you ignite, the tree. Who produced it? You or was it us who produced the tree? That's verse number 72. Verse number 73, Allah says, we have made it a reminder and provision for the travelers. When people are traveling, they need light. They need to ignite their stoves. They need to use things. They need so much. Someone might say, well, nowadays there's electricity. Well, take a look at how it is generated. Where did it come from? Who provided it? Subhanallah. 
Allah says, so exalt the name of your Lord, the most great. Sabbih bismi rabbik. That means say, subhana rabbi al-a'la. Say, glory be to my Lord, the highest. Or the greatest. Then Allah says, then I swear by the setting of the stars. Fala uqsimu bi mawaqi'in nujum. I swear by the setting of the stars. And indeed, it is an oath if you could know most great. Indeed, it is a noble Quran in a register, well protected. None touch it except the purified. Subhanallah. Here, according to the Mufassireen, what is being spoken about is Allah al mahfuz It is the preserved tablet or the preserved slate in heaven where the Quran is written. Allah says, none touch it except the purified, referring to the angels. Now, some of the scholars make mention of the Quran itself and the fact that if you want to touch it, you must be in a state of purity. You should not be in a state of Janaba and so on. That too is a ruling that the jurists have made mention of. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking of the preserved tablet. And then he says, it is a revelation from the Lord of the worlds. So after Allah drew our attention to so much that he's given us, he says, I've sent you a reminder in the form of a Quran. Respect it, read it, understand it, put it into practice and understand that it's a gift of Allah. It is revelation from the Lord of the worlds. Subhanallah. And Allah asks a question. Is it to, to this statement that you are indifferent? This Quran, these words, you are indifferent. Do you make thanks for your provision that you deny the provider himself? How are you being grateful to Allah for what he gave you by denying him? That's a question. And this is the state of a lot of people. Allah gives them health, Allah gives them wealth, Allah gives them good looks, Allah gives them sustenance, they have so much, Allah has provided for them absolutely everything, but they are not interested in thanking Allah through obeying His commands, not at all, or abstaining from His prohibitions, not at all. So Allah says, I am the provider, how are you thanking me? Are you thanking me by denying me? Is that thankfulness? Is that gratitude? It's a question you need to ask yourself. We all need to ask ourselves. Subhanallah. This is showing us that gratitude to Allah is actually through obeying His instruction. When you can get up for Salatul Fajr without anyone reminding you, or even if they do remind you, but you get up without the batting of an eyelid, you know, as soon as your alarm goes, you're up and you enthusiastically go and make your wudu and you're so delighted and you're happy and you come and you fulfill your salah like a very happy person. That is called saying thank you to Allah. You are thanking Allah. You are actually being grateful. That's what gratitude is all about. You can dress appropriately. That is gratitude to Allah. You worship Allah alone. That is gratitude to Allah. You learn what the Prophet ﷺ taught and you want to practice it exactly as he did. That is gratitude to Allah because he was the messenger sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Haram and sin is so easy to be committed and you say, no, we've left it for the sake of Allah. That is gratitude to Allah. Sin is easy to be committed. You don't. Or if you had bad habits, bad ways, say drugs and alcohol and whatever other bad habits, and you cut them for the sake of Allah, that is gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You were in the nightclubs every weekend. And you danced to the dirtiest of music and then you quit it and cut it all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is gratitude to Allah. So Allah is saying, well, be grateful. Allah is saying, look at man. Man gives thanks. Is that thanks just by saying thank you, thank you, thank you, oh Allah. You know, you clasp your hands or you do whatever. Some of the people of different faiths and even some of the Muslimin, they just say, I thank Allah for everything he's given us. And the next thing they send you. Is that gratitude? Does Allah need your lip service? No way, not at all. That's just words from your tongue. 
Then Allah says, then why when the soul at death reaches the throat and you are at that time looking on and our angels are nearer to him. In fact, Allah says, and we are nearer to him than you. But you do not see. Some of the Mufassireen say here, Allah is speaking of the angels. So Allah is asking you a question that one day you're going to die and one day the soul will reach your throat. Let's pause for a moment and think of it. Today your blood is, mashallah, flowing. Your heart is pumping. Alhamdulillah, you're healthy. And Allah says one day it will stop. It has to stop, subhanallah. And your soul will come out and it will get to your throat. And we're promising you that that has to happen. You better be grateful before that happens. Allah says, when the, th when the soul at the time of death reaches the throat and you are at that time looking on and we are nearer to him than you or nearer to it than you, but you do not see, then why do you not if you are not to be recompensed, bring it back. If you should be truthful. Allah says, if you believe that we are not going to take account of your deeds and you're not going to be recompensed for the things that you've done, then why don't you stop your soul from coming out of your body? Stop it. Let's see. You cannot. Allah says, if you are truthful, bring that soul back and put it back into your bodies. Do you know people are preserving bodies in order to save them for a day when they believe that they will be able to bring the souls back and put them into the bodies. This is what's happening really on a global level. There are certain wealthy people who are preserving, freezing their bodies for a day when they believe they'll be able to bring it back to life. They say one day we'll discover how to do it. Allah says, yeah, go keep on trying. It's not going to happen. So Allah is asking you the question, and asking me and every one of us to say that, will you bring it back, the soul, after it has departed the body? If you are truthful, well, those who disbelieve, if they are truthful in the fact that, or in their statement that there's no resurrection, there is no future, uh, th th there is no life after death, there is no recompense, and so on, Allah says, well, bring the soul back, let's see. And if the deceased was of those brought near to Allah, then for him is rest and bounty and a garden of pleasure. So Allah says, when the true believers die, they know that they are going to a very, very good place. My mothers and sisters, I want to stop for one minute to tell you something very important. You need to have hope in the mercy of Allah. When you get old and your body starts aching and perhaps your health begins to fail, you need to be able to bear sabr and have hope in the mercy of Allah and continue reminding yourself that Allah loves you and He will definitely take you to the best place, far better than whatever you've had on earth here. Allah will definitely recompense you and He will forgive your sins. He definitely will forgive your sins. Ask Him to forgive you, you will be forgiven. Ask Him to grant you Jannah, He will give it to you. He is the most merciful. He is the greatest, the most beneficent. He is Allah. He will give it to you. Have good hope in Allah. Don't think, oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to miss my kids and my grandchildren. And you know, now I'm going to miss this one and that one. No, you are going just like everyone else has gone to a far, far better place because you're a believer. Didn't you utter the Shahada? Yes. Didn't you believe in Allah alone? Yes. Didn't you try to protect yourself from shirk as much as possible? Yes. Didn't you try to follow the example of Muhammad وسلم, as best as possible? Yes. Well then, didn't you seek constant forgiveness? Yes. Didn't you ask Allah for Jannah? Yes. Well, nothing's going to be wasted. Remember that. So don't lose hope. No matter what you're going through, you will go to a better place. We cling to dear life, thinking that life is beautiful. The minute you cross to the other side, you might tell yourself, I should have come here a long, long time back, man. I wasted myself there with all the power cuts and everything. Yo.
So Allah is telling us that if the person who died was of those brought near, falawla in kana min al muqarrabin, if he was from among those brought near to Allah, then for him there is rest and bounty and a garden of pleasure. And if he were from the companions of the right, then the angels will say, peace for you, you are from the companions of the right. Subhanallah. Those who will get their books on the right side, they will be VIPs. May Allah make us from among those. Today you get a VIP ticket to a football match that might even be ended before the 90 minutes because of violence and we get excited. Allahu Akbar. We get excited. Hey, I sat right in the front. Did you check me on TV? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. That for us is like the highlight of our lives. That's it too. The peak. Now I can die. You know why? Because I attended UEFA. Wow. Right. First, first saf. But Salatul Fajr, I wasn't even in the last saf. May Allah forgive us. You want your book on the right side? Well, you need to make sure your priorities are all right. I'm not saying it's haram to do this or do that. But I'm saying make sure you please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, you may want to enjoy life a little bit here and there. You may want, for as long as it's within the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and for as long as you're fulfilling the other duties, and you know that your aim is to get the book on the right side, the day of judgment, not to get a little trophy on earth for a little while. And then when we die, we don't even get the book, let alone anything else. We get it on the left. Astaghfirullah. May Allah never do that to us. Allah says, if he was from the companions of the right, the angels will tell him peace for you from the companion you are indeed from the companions of the right but if he were from the deniers who were astray then for him is accommodation of scalding water and burning in the hellfire indeed this is true certainly and it is definitely happening allah says once again so exalt the name of your lord the most great فَسَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ Say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. Uh, the first one I said, Al-A'la, but actually here it says, Al-Azim. So you say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. You are declaring the greatness of Allah, praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, saying, My Rabb is indeed the greatest. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant us goodness in this world and the next. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik.